becomes a one strand and a political critique of and a political foundation for the uh, overthrow or the pushing aside of, uh, of patriarchy. But that she doesn't anticipate. She does not anticipate that at all. She does not see she does not see lesbian, lesbian relations as the foundation of a political movement because time and time again I think she is very, very sceptical of the possibility of a women's movement because of the situation of women here. She's very sceptical and where there has been a women's movement like the suffragette movement it has been for as far as she's concerned manipulated by men. So it has not, had not been an authentic one. One might actually say that in the authentic, in feminist movement would be included for here included here for Beauvoir. Um, well the irony is The irony is that her book laid the foundations precisely for a changing of consciousness and and the understanding of of, of female domination, understanding of this inauthentic response that led people to, led women to participate and create a feminist movement that she herself recognized had strong, authentic moments later in her life. So she laid the foundations for something that she really, I don't think, imagined to be possible in 1949. That was a long answer to your question, Simeon, but thank you very much. Any other questions? Celia. Um, did she discuss like how or why you would have an authentic versus an inauthentic response? Why or what? Like what leads to somebody having an inauthentic response versus an authentic response? Yeah, yeah. Or at least people. To what, what leads to people understanding the inauthenticity of their response? Yeah. Um, well, she clearly got this idea, of, and that's why she's a sociologist. But she recognizes the constraints. And inauthenticity is really and emerges from the fact that women are dispersed amongst men, dependent upon men, circulate around men, and materially dependent upon them. And so she can understand that. But why somebody would break out of that is the question you're asking. And I think that she ultimately relies on the capacity of human beings to actually shape the conditions of their own existence. That once comprehending them, there is the possibility, and this is the anti-sociological move in her, that somehow they, by grasping the reality of their inauthenticity, they will then struggle to lead an authentic life. And... But she recognizes how difficult that would be in 1949 in France, and she recognizes the greater possibility for independent women like herself to actually realize that potentiality. But there is no, no, I don't think, it's not like Marx has a theory of the development of class struggle, for example. Wrong or right, there's a theory there. I don't think that she has a theory, my view, she does not have a theory of how one moves from state of imminence to transcendence. Um, so she's a sociologist in establishing the constraints, but she's not a sociologist, you might say, um, in establishing the movement from one, one sta- state to another. Yeah, that's the ambiguous one. There is, and this is the existential moment, the sort of reliance on the self that if we want, if we want, we can change the world. Yeah. That's that volitional moment. Yeah, so that's why it's particularly interesting because of its... Because it doesn't answer your question. <laughs> Yes, but that's very good. And of course, the other issue is, I might add, is what is authentic and what is inauthentic, huh? Yeah, that's tricky stuff. Yeah, that's tricky stuff. And we're going to come, when we come to ransacking, we're going to have to pose the problematize. You know, from what standpoint is she saying that women who stay at home and want to have children are in some sense, is that an inauthentic response? Uh huh. I mean, we might battle over that, right, Celia? Yes, indeed. Yes, Hannah. You said earlier that, um, the social revolution for her is not only necessary for equality. I have, like, a general understanding of this, but I'm still kind of thinking. Well, she, you know, she's, she has a more or less orthodox Marxist understanding that, you know, there is going to be something like communism, socialism in the future, and that that socialist revolution, however conceived, necessarily will bring about some form of equality between genders, and that will lay the conditions for gender emancipation. So it's in the realm of freedom. So that's... Ah, yes, well, that's the same, you're asking, very good, Anna, you're asking the same, very good, very good, excellent. You're asking the same question as Celia. So, yes, it's a necessary condition, the social revolution, but she is clearly unclear about what is the sufficient condition to move from equality to emancipation. I think it's just, I mean, you know, it's again, it's the same question you're asking. It's almost as if, if we are presented with a world where we realize the possibility of freedom, we will therefore immediately spontaneously struggle for it. And the problem is that we are subject to what another theorist will call symbolic domination. We are either sort of brought into the existing system or we don't even recognize gender domination as such. Once we do recognize it, somehow we will then struggle for freedom. That's, I think, the presumption here. But we as sociologists are very skeptical of this. Yes, Mari. So, I get that she's saying that like, men aren't like, autonomous individuals because they are still slaves like, to the labor market, and that's why we need socialism. But what we also need is gender equality within socialism. What would be the man's incentive within socialism to go this step? Right, absolutely. So, yes, I mean, that's a set you're asking. You're up. This is just so wonderful. Yeah, you're demonstrating that you are a true sociologist and that you are deserving of a degree. Yes, what is there to guarantee? Why would men want to give up? So, no, yeah, why would, well, one claim is, of course, one claim is that socialism will automatically generate gender 
equality, um, including reproductive rights. But we know from the actual historical examples of socialism that that does not actually happen. So under what conditions, why even the socialist revolution give rise to equality, never mind emancipation? Uh, and so, and why would, why would men want to move from even equality to emancipation? Well, that's a real problem. I mean, again, if men would only realize, if men would only realize that their freedom was at stake in the emancipation of women. It's a matter of recognition. You know, it is not so stupid. This book, when, ah, that was the point of the film. The book that she wrote did actually affect the way people, women in particular, thought about gender domination and led them to behave in new ways. So it is not a, not a totally ridiculous idea that somehow thinking about the world in new ways, recognizing domination where we did not see domination before, recognizing domination where we saw only natural relations, recognizing that domination can inspire people to change the world, change their own patterns of behavior and also work with others to change social structures. I think that's... It's a very intellectualistic view that somehow, you know, it's what actually Marx and Engels criticize in the German ideology, some ideas drive history. But we are returning to this question, and she's almost saying that, you know, yes, if we recognize, if women recognize this, then they will behave differently. But we'll, we'll encourage men to Yeah, right, you kept on coming back to that one. <laughs> well, men too, if they read this, perhaps might realize that why they dominate women, that this is a product, it's nothing natural, but it's a product of their own insecure status. And that, that they may too see the possibility of new types of relations with women. This may sound a little bit far-fetched to you, but that is what she's claiming, that somehow if men too, like capitalists, will somehow realize that they too have an interest in communism. Because they hate having to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate all the time. It's horrible to be a capitalist, as we know. Yeah. Yes, Jason number two. No, it's not Jason number two. You, who are you up there? <laughs> oh, Aaron number two. I got my number twos all mixed up. Yes. Well, as far as the last point about, you know, capitalists, uh, you know, wanting to actually see the value in, in moving out of capitalism. And it just made me think that as much as she focuses on, you know, she's moving out towards, uh, towards this idea, she misses the opportunity to address the fact that I think one of the things that makes men dominate women in the way they do socially is a fetish with women as objects, and that's why men objectify women, is this, you know, wanting to control them just like happiness want to control other material benefits and that by realizing that there's something beyond that that maybe that would you know drive a, a movement away from this country. Right, so if the men understand that it is in their domi- that they are dominated by their domination, aha, if they understand that they are in a sense trapped by their domination, that if they understand that they too may work with women for an more emancipated, you know. Looking at this historically, one might argue I might be on dicey ground. But you might argue that actually relations between men and women have become more respectful. However, no, I knew I'd be in trouble. <laughs> have, be, have become more respectful in, for example, this society over the last 50 years, among certain sectors of the population. <laughs> Unnamed. You think that's, a, that's an implausible hypothesis? Compare yourselves with your parents. <laughs> oh, you don't know anything about your parents. Okay. Do you think that's an implausible, that's an implausible, I didn't say it's emancipation, don't quote me. I said things have come more, there's more reciprocity, more reciprocity between men and women. Yeah, maybe. Juliana, you're going to hang in on this one? Um, well, what Aaron was saying, what Aaron was saying that I really resonated with because, you know, in the language of talking with other names, then it comprises emancipation. And I think that's what I was trying to say with Aaron was that, you know, in the language of talking with other names, then it comprises emancipation. Very good. So, yes, indeed, what feminism offered was a whole new language to think about relations between men and women that allowed people to think of alternative ways of relating. Well, you avoided the empirical question there, but uh, yes, Matthew. Yeah, I just want to say um, one thing. Uh, if we're talking about feminism nowadays, um, in terms of gender domination, I think. One thing you'll find that since there's so many more single mothers nowadays, it's the, especially the men who are raised by single mothers, and I'm, I'm going to speak from my own experience. I was raised by a single mom, so I know what it's like to be at the receiving end of gender domination because whatever affected my mom affected me directly for 18 years of my life, and it still does. And so, um, and I was talking with um, a professor at community college that I attended, and she teaches um, psychology of women, and she was saying how, in her experience, some of the strongest feminists she's seen are men who have been raised by single mothers. Mm-hmm. And so... So you understand how your emancipation is so closely linked to the emancipation of women. Exactly. exactly. Mm-hmm. But nobody's daring to say how things are changed. Well, yeah, you're implying that. Simeon, yes. That's the premise of co-parenting being one of these. I don't know sort of like roads, right? I mean, one of the ideas she throws out there for approaching uh, gender equality. Right, but I mean, I don't see how that goes against 
I've seen like value of co-parenting by being raised by like I mean because it was just me and my mom since I had to do half the chores, half the things, and so I've been socialized into that way of thinking about things, and I understand the way, or not the way, but the, the value of having two people in the household. Uh huh. 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 Neil. Um, <laughs> actually, it has nothing to do with that. No, I was going to say I think some some ways you can kind of see that we've come a little bit is with things like Title IX, um, kind of the push at jobs to enforce sexual harassment and things like that, and that's the you know, to not make certain occupations that previously were always clubs that everyone followed a lot of women to be more inclusive. I think the wage... Uh, well, that is the movement towards equality. The question is, has the relationship between men and women become of a sort in which men recognize women as subjects as well as objects and vice versa? Absolutely not. But we, Absolutely not. No, I, I, think, I think men have just been forced to have to tolerate certain uh-huh. as opposed to actually embodying them as equal. I think it's just more of a... It's been imposed upon men to have to deal with certain things, but it's, it's one of those things you're... You know, why do men dominate women? And I think the simple answer is because they can. I don't think it's because of any other... It's because, okay, okay, very good, very good, very good. Thank you very much for your info. Yeah, yeah, very good, yes. Aaron, Aaron, number one. Well, it's anyway, you said I think that. I think that part of the problem is that, according to some scholars, women have now been put under women as a way of beating the rape. For example, Gary Lilly, Levy, in the female show of his kids, talks about how women will you know, hit the pole. Um, and, and reproduce sort of sexual objectification acts as, as, a, as a way of sort of liberating uh, their own sexuality uh, through this sort of like self objectification as supposed to be legal. So I think it complicates the situation because men see a win win situation um, in that if women are willing to uh, see themselves as sexual playthings, then in the, you know, in the end that, that's part of like the male gaze. That suddenly the male gaze has become a form of empowerment for not only. Well, not only the men who appreciate gays, as McKinnon would say, but also for, for women who, who buy into it as a form of sexual freedom. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That sounded very sophisticated. I'm very much like McKinnon, yes. No, that's tr- Yes. So you're saying that this inauthenticity can be turned around? Yes, they complicate this. And in a complicated way. Well, that's what we're going to deal with when we get to McKinnon. We're going to see in what ways this inauthenticity can be turned around. Yes. All right. Whoa. Oh, no new hands. Aha. Oh, shoot. All right. Quick. Quick. Well, I think what you brought up about, you know, um, like, uh, sexual harassment, uh, generating equality in employment, things like that, and to what might be actually a shift, but not anywhere near the emancipation or reciprocal liberation that we're talking about. Right. We have to move towards equality. Just one simple line that stood out in the introduction that makes me realize the shift is on page 30 of the introduction. She's talking about men thinking women steal their jobs because he never questioned his rights in this world. And when we pass legislation regarding sexual harassment, about equality you know, and employment and things like that, we're starting to question those rights. We're, we're actually maybe shifting our view a little bit, but we're still nowhere close to maybe on the other hand it may be intensifying the relations of domination that's what that's what the cynic on the front row was suggesting yes interesting shush 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 <laughs> <laughs> this is not a male dominated class Juliana <laughs> Right. So, you know, as long as we look at the progress and see what it obscures, when we label it progress and we look also be very aware of that what that Right, right. So Foucault would say progress, schmogress, right? <laughs> progress hides new forms of domination, right? So, okay, I just want to, I can't resist since we're, since we're, we're still in the summary. I, uh, I, <laughs> well, no, we've been ransacking, we've been ransacking. I'll summarize and ransacking in a second. But, you know, one of the interesting points is that, uh, that Beauvoir is saying, actually, I would like to read to you one passage. Whoa, where is it? Oh. One passage on page 725. Where she's really summarizing the argument she's making. 725, this idea of the othering of women. 725. 